I am so tired. Hi, hello, welcome to the episode 5 of Freaked Out Podcast. My name is Fabian Adams. Why am I this loud? Sorry. Is this better? Hope so. Um, hi, welcome to the episode 5 of Freaked Out Podcast. My name is Fabian and I'll be your host today. I am so tired today. I don't know what's going on. Is it because um, the, you know, the stuff happening in my country and the general feel of media and social media and everything that's been going on but i am like i was on a verge of quitting this podcast this morning when i realized when i wanted when i decided to to record an episode and i was just laying in my bed and i was on a verge of quitting and then i was like just fucking do it just do it you feel so much better after recording an episode just fucking do it so here i am hi so today we are talking about the Susan Cox Powell story. Are you familiar with the story? I heard it 1000 times, but from one podcast, because I was returning and re-listening that episode. It's the, and that's why we drink podcast. I mean, my favorite podcast of all time. And this is my favorite episode of my favorite podcast. Not because it's lighthearted, but because it's the story full of twists and turns. So my main sources about this um this episode are, and that's why we drink podcast, I said, and Wikipedia. That's it. <laughs> Great job. Great job. So we're talking about the Susan Cox Powell, her husband, Joshua Powell, their children, Charles Joshua and Brandon Timothy and Susan's father-in-law, Su- Stephen Powell, but you'll see. So Joshua Powell, he was born in 1976. He had a brother, Michael and Jonathan and two sisters, Alina and Jennifer. Um, their parents divorced pretty, pretty early, and the children were left with Stephen. And Stephen was, how should I say, um, not a great father figure, to say at least, because he made them watch pornography with him. And on one occasion, he took his daughter on a trip. I don't know which daughter, was it Alina or Jennifer, but he took his daughter on a trip and he made her watch a porn movie with him. And he later made her describe in detail how she felt while watching a movie, a porn movie with his fa- with, with her father. And if they wet the bed during the night, he would make them bath in ice water to shock them to shock that behavior out of them so they would not do that again. I suggest um, some some tutorial on how to be a parent or, I don't know, try harder. So in 1998, Joshua was studying in Seattle and there he met Catherine Everett at the LDS church and they soon started dating and they were living together. Catherine later claimed that Joshua was extremely controlling she was not allowed to go anywhere alone. He controlled her money. And she was so scared of him that she left him over a phone ho- phone call on one occasion when he went alone to visit a friend in Utah. So she was that scared of him and that controlled that she had to wait for him to go on a trip so she can dump him, basically. And if you were not in toxic relationship ever in your life, you simply do not understand how hard it is to leave a toxic person. A little compassion would be amazing while talking about the victims, I would suggest. Then Joshua met Susan Cox, the main star of the story, sadly. He met her in the year 2000 on a Mormon course they both attended. They got married in 2001 and they got their two children, one in 2005 and the other in 2007. Joshua, during the, the pregnancies, Joshua was completely apathic towards Susan and towards the pregnancy itself. On one occasion when Susan was in pain and she uh, asked to be taken to the hospital, he told her, because he was uh, repairing a computer, I believe, or something like that, um, he told her, quote-unquote, can you wait a little? Do you see I'm busy? So he graduated in economics and Susan was a beautician. They lived with uh, first in the uh, early ages, in the early times of their marriage, they lived with his father, Stephen, for a while in his house. But later they moved to Utah 
in 2003 because Susan felt uncomfortable around him. I wonder what she knew at the time. Um, I'll tell you later, but um, I wonder what she knew at the time because she felt uncomfortable around him. Although their marriage was ideal, quote unquote, we know what happens in a in a ideal marriages. Um, or let me change that: um, how people feel in the marriages that seem ideal. We had the similar situation in the episode in three. So although their marriage seemed ideal for the, all the people, um, their marriage slowly fell apart because Joshua, again, was possessive. He wanted to have control over Susan and her money. And since he didn't work anywhere, Susan basically paid for everything. Uh, but she could not use her own money. He would give her a list of groceries weekly that she had to buy, and he gave her only $10. Like, the budget was $10 and a long list of groceries. Like, what she should buy with that? What? With the two children. And on one occasion, when she said that the children were hungry, he told her, quote-unquote, why does he even have to eat? He'll shit it out anyway. Um, yes, congrats, sir. That's how things work. But, um, you do that too, so why do you eat? And it's your fucking child. What do you mean he'll shit it anyway? He also had his pantry with snacks, that snacks she bought with her own money, and he locked that snacks, so she couldn't even eat the snacks she bought for for him. The rest of the money he spent on computer equipment, uh, which was his great passion, while Susan and the children had basically nothing to eat. On one occasion, he bought 20 kilograms of wheat, like unprocessed wheat. Why? Just to show he can buy it? Or what? What? You know that TikTok sound. What was the reason? What was the reason? And after everything that happened in the in the continuation of the story, um, a neighbor testified that Susan once uh, asked that neighbor to buy her children hot dogs and smuggle them into the house because they had nothing to eat and they were hungry. But again, where was that neighbor before everything happened? I call bullshit, but okay. Josh and Susan uh, officially declared bankruptcy in 2007 and were in debt of $20,000. No, $20,000. $20, I'm always mixing the hundreds and thousands. Wait for it. English is not my first language, sorry. And then I remember like, the year is called 2023, it's so, so not, it's not a thousand, it's hundred. <laughs> I'm total moron, it is thousand, <laughs> it is twenty thousand dollars. So they declared bankruptcy in 2007 and they were in debt of two hundred thousand dollars. So on December 6th, 2009, Susan and her, ch her children were in the church in the morning. Then later in the afternoon, they, their neighbor stopped by in the afternoon and uh, they left around five. And that was the last time Susan was ever seen. So like, bam, we just jumped into the story. Lol. The next day, the children didn't show up at the kindergarten. They called from the kindergarten uh, and they couldn't get Susan and Joshua on the phone, none of them. And then they called a neighbor who panicked because they had they, uh, the the neighbor knew that Josh and Susan had installed a new heating system a, a few days earlier. So she called the police to make sure that they didn't die of poisoning of carbon monoxide. She was scared. And police came and they broke into the house. They did not find anyone there. They broke a window and got into the house, but no one was there. Uh, but they came across unusual scenery in the house, um, like two large industrial fans, like, you know, those big fans, like industrial fans, not like normal fans, industrial fans. So the two large industrial fans were turned on and like pointed to the sofa to dry the sofa because the sofa was washed. Like, not washed, soaked, dripping, as well as the carpet, like, soaked, soaked, washed. And then two industrial fans blowing to dry it off, like, suspicious. They also found Susan's purse, 
her documents and a small key in her purse. But the phone was not there. The phone was later found in the car. At 5 p.m. that day, Joshua returns to the house with his sons, but there was no sign of Susan. And when uh, they asked, where, where is Susan? He said that she was at work, but um, she didn't come to work that day. Anyway, so he said that she was at work and he took the kids, um, the kids camping to Simpson Springs around midnight the night before. Because, you know, they came, they uh, went the midnight because they wanted to watch the sunrise while camping and to spend the whole day there, not to spend the night, the day in the travel. He also did not uh, give a call to his work. He, in the meantime, he was started working somewhere and he did not give a call the night before because he allegedly thought that was Saturday evening and not Sunday evening. Or he thought like they were going on a on the night between Saturday and Sunday and then they were spending the day camping and he thought it was Sunday, but it was actually Monday. Do you get me? Like, my brain is melting. His presence in Simpson Springs was later confirmed confirmed by a shepherd who saw them and talked to them. So he indeed was in Simpson Springs with his children. Joshua was taken in for the questioning. He did not show any concern that his wife had literally disappeared, uh, but he was very upset when he heard that the police had broken a window to enter the house. Um, okay, you can buy another window. Where is Susan? He didn't care. He claimed that Susan did not go with them. And what he didn't know is that the in the another office, there was a parallel questioning of their older son. And he said that, quote unquote, Mom went with them but didn't come back. And when he was asked where where she is, he said, Mommy stayed there where the crystals grow because it's very nice there where crystals grow. Okay. Um, and later when uh, Joshua found out what he said, he basically called his own son a liar. A co-worker on that new job he got uh, said that a couple of years ago, Joshua said that he knew the ideal way to hide a body because he and Susan loved true crime shows. People, don't listen to me. And most importantly, don't quote me in police. <laughs> you did not get any idea of me. Please! So... He said that he knew the perfect way to dispose a body and hide a body because he and Susan loved true crime shows. And that and he said that the best way to hide a body is one of the mines in the deserts of western Utah because those mines were really unapproachable and a large amount of them were and are closed and you cannot enter them safely. The police searched those months later, but they were, as I said, very unapproachable, and there, plus there are a lot of them, like hundreds and thousands of mines, and they didn't find anything, but also they could not get inside one of them, because someone recently poured dangerous chemicals in it. Um, suspicious? Also, fun fact, in many of those mines, crystals were excavated. And the, that same son, while he was in the kindergarten, he drew a trip. They had a task to draw, you know, their favorite trip somewhere. And he drew that trip. He drew three people in the car and he, uh, he, him and his brother and his father. And when the educator asked where your mom is, he said, mom is in the truck. Joshua did not hesitate to cancel Susan's ske scheduled visits to the chiropractor very quickly. He didn't hesitate to close her bank account, and very soon they left Utah, like moved in with his father, with his father Stephen, very quickly, like in period of two weeks. He closed her bank account, he cancelled chiropractor and they moved to his father's house. Shortly afterwards, the site susanpowell.org appeared, claiming to be the official site of the investigation. And there, an anonymous person claimed that 
Susan was in a love affair with the journalist Stephen Kosher. And Stephen Kosher was a person who also disappeared at the same time as Susan. So they found, so they claimed that they were in a love affair and that they fled to Brazil together, as well as that she was mentally unstable. Susan's family publicly distanced themselves from this. There was no evidence of that. And it is believed that those posts were written by Joshua and his father later. So now we talk about Stephen. Like I just take a sip of my hello. Sorry, I love this drink. The investigation then turned in Stephen's direction after Susan's friend said that she complained to her that her father-in-law was harassing her and not giving her peace even after they moved to Utah. However, uh, they had no warrant to search his house, so the police, together with Susan's family, regularly protested. They made small gatherings in order to attract attention about Susan's disappearance right in front of the shop where Stephen regularly shopped in order to provoke him, basically, to say something. And they succeeded. Once provoked, Stephen yelled, Do you really think you're going to do something with this? And he said, yelled at that. To Susan's poor father, who was trying, who was basically standing there trying to raise attention about finding his daughter. Terrible. And then, this idiot says, We have her diaries. She escaped with that journalist. Everything is written in her diary, which is at my house. And he yelled that. And he didn't know that the police was there listening. So they approached him and they were like, you have her diaries. Why don't you say so? And you can see that he was not too bright in the head because he fell for like literally everything the police said. They were like, you have nothing to hide. We know you're innocent. We just want to look around and maybe look at those diaries and just, you know, to confirm your story and so on. And he fell for it. And he allowed them to enter the house without a warrant because he was like believing that he was not guilty. And they basically said that (laughs) they believe he's not uh, guilty and he was nothing to be afraid of. And this dumb head let him into the house without a warrant. Great. Then they searched the house. And oh boy, they found a lot of shit. Not only did they found Susan's diaries, which he and Joshua basically stole and confiscated without the knowledge of the police, but in those diaries, of course, there was no evidence that she had an affair with a journalist, but also they found Stephen's diaries. (laughs) in which he wrote literally everything from detail to detail, daily. Like his whole life, everything was in those diaries. They found out that he was deeply in love with Susan, that he touched her while he passed by him while they lived together. He even tucked his hands under her skirt. They also found the recordings. And on one recording, he even admitted to her, like the recordings are from camera, that he was secretly filming her. And on one recording, he even admitted to her that he loved her. Let me um, remind you that in this period, she had 21 years and he had 59. <gasps> she turned him down, basically, naturally. But he didn't stop. Um, his explanation was, she never said no. She said, I can't do that. No means fucking no. What? What? I am. I have no words. They also found terrible things he collected. Like he collected dirty, her dirty underwear, tampons used. Bruh. He took her hair off, like the hair of her brush, and he kept it in a Ziploc bags, all with the dates on it. To, I don't know, to keep the aroma, I guess. He cut her face off from photos and he glued it on the bodies from pornographic magazines. He also filmed himself masturbating to those photos. He looked at her with the mirror under the bed from door, you know, like these creeps in movies. He even wrote songs for her. As since she was not the first woman he persecuted, they also found various variations of the same songs he just changed the name. He followed her around the city and he was convinced that she was just provoking him. How? She was waving her hair, 
she was adjusting her skirt. And this psycho believed that she was provoking him. She was walking down the street, window blowing her skirt, window blowing her hair. The fuck? Once she asked him to touch her leg because she walked, at, uh, she, uh, she worked at the studio and she practiced waxing and he was like, she wanted me to touch her legs. What the fuck? They also found child pornography. Um, he filmed. Uh, he filmed two girls from the house next door and he filmed them bathing ar- uh, through the bathroom window and they finally arrested him. I mean, I, I don't know what he expected to happen because he said like, yeah, feel free to inspect my house. Like, there is nothing nothing in there. And then he kept child pornography, diaries, and used tampons. The day after he was arrested, Susan's parents applied for custody of their sons and they were soon granted the custody. Uh, it was very difficult for them to get custody over the real parents. So they looked for all the ways and they finally found a document from the divorce of Stephen and George's mother. They found the documents from the di- from divorce of Stephen and his wife, the Joshua's mother. And on those documents, Joshua claimed that their father forced them to mistreat the mother, their mother. And once uh, she said to Josh that he should have respect for her, she's, her, she's his mother, he replied, Respect is earned, mother. And what did you do to deserve my respect? My eyes are popping off my head. (laughs) He once killed his sister's hamster, Joshua, and threatened his mother with a knife and once tried to kill himself, like when he was a child. And therefore, they managed to show that Joshua is not very stable since childhood, and they later found also pornography on a hard drive. I'll talk that about little later. Like pornography on his computer. Actually on Susan's computer, but you'll see. Susan's colleagues said that she had a safe and that the key they found in her purse could open that safe. And they went and and when they found the safe and the um, opened it with that key, they found a camera and a video inside the camera where she filmed her property and said that if something happened to her, they should have a video of her property so that Josh could not take it and claim that's his. They also found a letter uh, with her writing, basically her will, and she said that not to give that letter to Joshua because she doesn't trust him and that if something happens to her, it may or may not be an accident, even if it seems so. And also they found out that she wanted to apply for a divorce and that the video that they found on that camera was at the urge of the divorce, divorce lawyer. But she later um, gave up that idea. The investigation also turned to Michael, Josh's brother, who recently, sorry, who recently sent his relatively new car to the landfill just a few days after Susan's disappearance and he demanded that the car is destroyed as soon as possible. He later even asked for a satellite image of the landfill to see if the car is destroyed or not. And the police uh, searched the car with the dogs and the cadaver dogs found the stench of the corpse in the trunk but um, the DNA analysis did not find anything. In late 2011, Jennifer, one of the sisters of Joshua, said that she believed her brother was responsible for the disappearance of Susan Cox. On the other hand, uh, Alina, the other sister, uh, was also suspicious, although she later withdrew the statement and she said that her brother has been abused by journalists. After Stephen was arrested, the children went into the hands of grandparents and Joshua rented a house in South Hill, more to show that he wanted to distance himself from the father than he really wanted to move, since he continued to visit visit, uh, Stephen's house on a daily basis. The police found incestuate pornography in Susan's computer, but like in a 3D version, like animated, or what does that mean in 3D version? Joshua claimed that he knew nothing about that, and that they bought the computer from acquaintances from the Mormon church. Uh, Joshua's computer, on the other fact, could not unlock because he put some strong code, because he was a programmer and it was his passion, for months, like 
not for days, for months. The machines and programs were decoding 24-7 and they could not unlock it. I don't know why they didn't have the right to ask him to unlock the computer. Um, on the other hand, in the Cox family, uh, Susan's parents tried in everywhere to provide a normal life for the boys who were the cent- literally in the center of this circus. Their, their missing mother, journalists, crazy grandfather and father, um, they testified that the boys were asking to sleep naked because their dad made them sleep naked with him in the same bed. In late 2011, a Google page appeared claiming that the boys had been abused by Susan's parents and that Joshua Joshua had been mistreated by the public. Soon it was removed for violating Google rules. Uh, All this time, there are regular trials and hearings about conservatorship and the disappearance and Joshua in the end got to see the children a few days a week. On February 5th, 2012, a social worker brought the children to Joshua and it was her duty to be in their presence while he was with the children to watch them. However, Joshua grabbed the children, pushed this worker away, he grinded and locked the door. She was locked out of the house. Very soon, she smelled gasoline and she called 911. The dispatcher, um, I don't know why was he not very, you know... I don't know if he didn't know what, if he didn't recognize the names or he just was new to the job, but he were asking like stupid questions like, are you the mother? Where is the mother? Who is it? What address? So this worker finally managed to get the dispatcher to send the patrol. And a few minutes later, the house where Joshua was locked in with his children exploded. The patrol arrived in only 20 minutes, and with them arrived the Chuck Cox, he was the grandfather, they were all dead. The fire was so big that it took hours to be put out, so so they could only enter the house at all. It was determined that the children died from smoke inhalation, but later they found out that they, they had traumas on the back of the head and neck, which means that he first hit them with something and knocked them unconscious, and then set the house on fire. About 20 minutes before that, he left a voice message to his sister, quotes, hey, I'm just calling to say goodbye, I can't live without my children, I can't go on, go on, I apologize to everyone I heard, goodbye, end quote. Stephen was not shocked when they called him, but he was very angry with the police and the way they said news to him. In 2012, Stephen refused under constitutional law, to cooperate in further research, although they found that he probably knew nothing since he wrote in his diaries, he was still writing his diaries, and he was, write, he was writing that he was waiting for the day for Susan to return to him from the, that crazy journalist she ran away with. Basically, he probably believed in that story, and he knew nothing else. Later that year, um, Michael, his brother, uh, Joshua's brother, if you remember the one that... Um, gave the car to be destroyed, he committed suicide because he was pronounced as one of the suspects. In 2013, the investigation was closed and it was no longer open, although it is assumed that Susan was dead and the Cox family made a foundation where an open portal for donations of victims of domestic violence still stands. The dispatcher, the stupid dispatcher, uh, was so shaken by the way he dis- responded to the call. I mean, we all would. Um, he later became a coach for 911 dispatchers. Um, it's not his fault. Like He probably was new and didn't know who the, the lady was talking about. And, and even if he sent the patrols right away, he, they came around 20 minutes later. So it would be... Stephen were, was actually released in 2017 after only seven years of service for child pornography that was found, and he died in 2018 of natural causes. In 2019, the Cold podcast disclosed that the quote-unquote incestuous cartoon porn found by Utah police was not Joshua, Joshua's, nor even came from his computer. Pornographic pictures were found 
to be on a computer that actually belonged to Susan and that the pornography had been reviewed by the computer's previous owners from whom she had purchased the used computer secondhandly. Um, Cole declined to identify the original owners of the computer because no criminal charges have been filed against anyone related to the images because, you know, they were cartoon child porn. But again, they were child porn. How can you not do anything about that? Anyways, Susan still remains a missing person, um, but given the fates of her son, it is widely believed that she was murdered by her husband, Joshua. Why I keep calling him Joshua? Joshua! There were calls as of March 2018 to have her declared dead, with the cause being homicide. And Joshua's computer remains locked to this day. And that is the end of the story. Ugh. That was a long story. Thank you so much for being here. If you want to hear more stories like this, please give us a subscribe. We are everywhere. Me and the podcast. That's we. <laughs> we are everywhere. Like Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, Chromecast, like everywhere. You can also follow me on Instagram. And that's uh, Fabian Adams. But instead of a B, it's a six. So it's face six Ian Adams. And the same on Twitter. And you can follow the podcast on Instagram, it's Freaked Out Podcast. Or on Facebook, it's Freaked Out Podcast by Fabian. And that is that. I'll see you, I guess, next week. (laughs) Thank you. Bye.